you would, uh, turn in your Bibles to Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. And uh, just for your information, men, you've got 12 more shopping days um, to get that perfect gift, okay? And let me just say that it is probably too late to order something online and get it here in time. You're going to have to go get it, all right? So be a good boy. Go get it. Not something that plugs in. Not something that works. Get it, okay? You got 12 days. If you ever looked at something or watched something, seen something unfold in front of you, and if you ever thought, you know, if that had been me, I'd have done it this way. Probably all of us have done that with something. You know, if it had been me, I don't think I'd have done that quite that way. I think a better way to have done it would have been this way. We think we pretty much have it all figured out, don't we? We know the right way to do it. I'm going to be honest. When I think about the Christmas story, if I didn't know the outcome of it, if I didn't know the rest of the Gospel of Luke, and I read the first couple of chapters of the Gospel of Luke, I'd think, God, what are you doing? This really doesn't make much sense. It's an odd way, and as the song says, indeed it is a strange way to save the world. If I was going to go about saving the world, I think I'd have been more like, you know, Marvel Comics kind of saving the world, you know? With clear-cut heroes and strong finishes, and but God kind of snuck it in, didn't he? So I want us to read the first part of the birth of Jesus this morning, and I want us to consider three questions that I hope will help us understand why God did it the way he did it, and more importantly, what that means for the person sitting in your seat today. Because God did it the way he did it, not just because he wanted to do it that way, but he did it that way because he's God and he knows what he's doing, and it matters for us today, just as much as it mattered then. Let's read the story, Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, and this morning we'll read down through verse 7. Next week, we'll pick up part two of the story. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David. To be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. She gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Join me as we pray together. Father, our prayer today is that through the power of your Holy Spirit at work, illuminating this word that it inspired in our minds and in our understanding, that you would show us why you did what you did and what that means for us today. Lord, I pray that today would be a message indeed, a message of hope and encouragement, a reminder to us of who we are in your sight. For we pray in the name of the one whose birth we celebrate, the name of Jesus. Amen. The main point I want us to get from our little journey through this part of the Christmas story is this, that that God has a redemption plan in which we are both recipients and participants. It's important for us to see it that way. God, this didn't just fall out this way. Uh, What we're going to see as we kind of dig into this a little bit this morning 
as this was, this was not just a series of circumstances and events that happened and God just took something that was random and made something out of it. No, this was part of a continuous story that started way back in the Garden of Eden. And this was just pretty close to the climax of the story. And it's a story that continues until this day. In fact, it's a story that's still being written. Your story is still being written. And it's all part of this grand and glorious story that is God's story. And so we are both recipients and we are participants of this plan that God hatched from the beginning of time and that what we just read logically falls into the progression of that story. We we'll discover that by asking three questions. First question is this, why them? Why them? Why Mary and Joseph? I mean, when you think about Mary and Joseph, two very nondescript people. I believe if we had been living in those days, we might have known Joseph, we might have known Mary, but we wouldn't have thought, well, you know, those are two exceptional people. Have you ever heard people say, you know, one day God is going to use you in great and marvelous ways? I don't know that we'd have necessarily said that about Mary and Joseph. They were just regular people. They were undergoing a regular process. In fact, uh, we find in, in, in verses 4 and 5, Joseph went up from Galilee to the town, from the town of Nazareth to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because that's where he was from. He was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed. Now, just real quickly, this process of betrothal is, is unlike anything that we know today. It's kind of like engagement, and it's kind of like marriage, but it's not either one of them. It was stronger than engagement, because if you're engaged and you get cold feet, you can decide to become disengaged. You can give the ring back, and you can say, I'm sorry, bud, but I found somebody who looks better, smells better, and makes more money than you do. Thanks, but no thanks. No harm other than maybe just some emotional harm involved in that. You couldn't do that in the betrothal process. It was a commitment. It was a contractual agreement. Now, I hate to take the, roman the romanticism out of it, but it was basically a contractual agreement between two families, a bride's family and a groom's family. My ugly son couldn't find anybody so we're going to hook him up with your homely daughter and we'll sign it on the dotted line and they're going to have to get married whether they like it or not. Now, it wasn't quite that extreme. But it was an agreement and it was a public agreement. It, it was a, a binding agreement that two people would spend their lives together. That very seldom would it have been a, a betrothal between two people who didn't like each other. There was at least a physical attraction there. They wanted to be together and so their families arranged for them to be together. But it wasn't quite marriage. In other words, they couldn't live together. They couldn't be together. It, it wasn't there yet because what happened was once the agreement was made, the groom then went back to daddy's house and began the work of building on to dad's house. And you see, that's what would happen for the newlywed. They would move in with the parents. Now, I don't know that that would be fun for either the newlyweds or the parents. But that's the way they did it back then. And so what the, what the groom-to-be would do is he would start preparing their little section. Of, they would build onto the house their own little living place attached to the family living place. Now the daughter, you had a daughter, you got her out of the house as quick as you could. But for the son, you wanted him around because he was going to work and help make money. You were even willing to let him build on the part of the house and make their own. And so that's what he was doing. So during this betrothal period, that's simply all that was going on. The groom was back home building a house for the bride and groom to live in. And when it was ready, he would announce his attention. He would come back. He would get the bride. There'd be this big week-long party. They would have the wedding, and then they would go back to this brand new house. And finally, the marriage would be complete and the marriage could be consummated. So they were in this in-between building time, but it was a legal commitment. 
And you know the back story behind all of that? You know, with Mary turning up pregnant and the angels having to let Mary and Joseph know, look, this is something special. This isn't what you think. But think about how they must have felt. Think about how they were viewed by the people around them. Mary turned up pregnant. We thought she was a fine, upstanding young lady. Now she's pregnant. And she's made up this crazy story that God made her pregnant. I mean, really. Come on. She expects us to believe that. You could just, you could understand and you could just imagine in your own mind, you could imagine what the conversation at the beauty shop was about Mary. All the names she was called at the beauty shop. Oh, and then there's Joseph. What kind of man was he? Boy, has he gotten off to a good start. He sure knows how to pick them. He's so attractive, and he was so, uh, she was so in love with him, she just couldn't wait. What does that say about him? And that poor sap, he could get rid of her, and he knows he can't do any better, so he's going to stick her. You could imagine what the conversation at the barbershop was about Joseph and how people would snicker and laugh at him as they walked through town. It's a crazy story they made up. God made her pregnant. Yeah, right. You two are crazy. But they believe what God said. And they forged ahead with the plan. Now, when you think about Mary and Joseph, we won't go deep into this, and I'll give you some Bible verses that you can look back at, but the genealogies, uh, the genealogy of, of Joseph we find in Matthew. It, it kind of opens the book of Matthew. And in the genealogy of Joseph, uh, who was believed, I think it even says in there, who was who was the, the, the husband of Mary, the mother of Jesus. His genealogy is traced all, in fact, he's the son of David, son of Abraham. His genealogy is traced in very strong Jewish tradition. Now, what that did was, that made Jesus very personal. That made Jesus very, uh, they were able to fact check. That's kind of their version of fact checking. They were listing names that, Anybody in Nazareth or anybody in Bethlehem would, oh, yeah, we know so. We've heard about the line of so-and-so, so-and-so. So this added validity to who he was, but it also added a very Jewishness to who he was. And in this genealogy of Joseph, as we see it traced back to David, that is the Messianic line, and as we see it traced back to Abraham, that's showing that God is continuing to work in his covenant line. And we're going to look at that covenant in just a minute. Then when you look at Mary, her genealogy is found in Luke chapter 3. Now, it looks odd because it starts with Joseph, but it says Joseph was the son of, and it was a different name than it says in Matthew 1. What's happened here is that to trace the genealogy of Joseph, they have taken Mary's family, and because now she was Joseph's wife, inserted Joseph's name. So that genealogy in Matthew 3, while it has Joseph's names atta name attached to it and a bunch of different names than his genealogy, it evidently was the genealogy of Mary. Here's the interesting thing about that genealogy. It traces Mary, Mary's lineage all the way back to Adam, all the way back to the creation. So already in the Gospel of Luke, through this couple that he chose, why them? Why Joseph? Why Mary? Son of, son of man? His genealogy goes all the way back to Adam. Son of God, the Messiah, his genealogy goes back to David and to Abraham. Even in Mary and Joseph, God is showing this is the plan that I hatched from the beginning. I want, I want us to look at a couple more verses. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, this is why it's important that Jesus' genealogy was traced all the way back to Adam and Eve. What's happened in the garden, Adam and Eve have sinned, and God has cursed Adam, God has cursed Eve, and then God curses the serpent who led them astray. And notice what he says to the serpent. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and, your, and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Right here in Genesis, right there in the Garden of Eden, right there in handing out the curses because of sin being introduced into the world, as soon as the, the consequences of sin was known, God began the story of grace. He told Eve, even though you've sinned, I'm going to use you. I'm going to use you in a mighty way. 
<clears throat> it is through you. It is through you that I will send a redeemer. And the devil will try to destroy him. And all he'll be able to do is as if he just puts a little bruise on his heel. But in the process of bruising his heel, your seed will completely crush Satan's head. Story of Jesus and what he did on the cross for us. Why Mary? That's why. This is part of the continuing story. All the way back to the beginning, the story begins. The Christmas story begins in Genesis chapter 3. Not in Matthew, not in Luke, not in the prophecies of Micah or Isaiah. All the way back in Genesis. It's a plan from the beginning. Then in Genesis chapter 12, in verses 1 through 3, we see the covenant with Abraham. As God said, uh, now, to the, now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred, and your father's house, to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation. And I will, three, three things he's going to do. I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And then the third, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. He said, now what in the world does that have to do with talking about the Messiah? In the New Testament, the disciples of Jesus understood that to be a prophecy of Jesus. Let's forward to Acts chapter 3 and verses 25 and 26, standing before the council, Peter explaining uh, uh, why they were preaching in Jesus' name and what had happened in Jesus' name. He said, And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also pro proclaimed these days. In other words, those days we're living in that this Messiah would come, that what's happening would happen. And you are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in you and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. He was talking about Jesus, whom they had just crucified, being the promise of Abraham's covenant. Now, I showed you all that just to say, why them? Why Mary? Why Joseph? The gospel is a continuous story. And the good news is, you are part of it today. You see, the Christmas story started all the way back in Genesis. And it didn't just begin with the birth of a child. And it didn't end with the crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. We're not in a holding pattern until Jesus returns. It's part of the story. We're living the story today. Mary and Joseph remind us that God uses ordinary people, people that no one else would have suspected, even people whose reputation has just a little bit of shade on it. God uses them for his purpose. How does that apply to us today? Like Mary or Joseph, there may be something in your past you're ashamed of. There may be something that the devil constantly reminds you of. You know what? You'll never amount to anything because of this. Maybe it's something that other people know about you and you're just embarrassed to death that they know it. Or maybe it's something nobody knows about you and, if it, and you just feel like if, if that ever became public, you would be ruined. The good news is when Jesus went to the cross, not only did he bear your sin, he bore your shame. God knew what it is you wish no one else knew. He knew. And he loved you anyway, and he sent his son to die for you, to redeem you, to make you his own. So in that sense, we are recipients of, of, of the work that God did through Mary and Joseph. Because of Jesus, our sin is forgiven. The shame is taken away. If God knows it and loves us anyway, why does it matter what anybody else thinks or knows about us? If God knows the truth and loves us, who really cares what anybody else, what, what opinion anybody else has of us. The one who matters most loves you most and gave his son for you. But not only are we recipients, we are part of the story because we are Mary and Joseph. By the way, you could look at the family tree of Mary and Joseph and you could find all kinds of interesting characters. 
You find prostitutes. You find incest. You find murderers. You find some pretty rough and tumble people in that genealogy that gave birth to Jesus. A reminder that God not only wants to give you grace, God wants to use you to carry His grace to others. Why them? Because the gospel is a continuous story, and you're part of it today. Second question we want to ask is this. Why then? Why did it have to happen when it happened? Galatians 4 tells us that it was in the fullness of time. At just the right time, God sent forth His Son. Fullness of time. At perfect time. Why was that the perfect time? Well, let's go back and read about those days. Verse 1. In those days. A decree went out from, and here's the first big name we see, Caesar Augustus. Caesar Augustus was the emperor. He was the longest serving Roman emperor in history. He served from 27 B.C. to A.D. 14. Were any of y'all around when he was serving? <laughs> that was a long time ago, wasn't it? I mean, he was before Christ. He was after Christ was born. He served from 27 to 14, 41 years as emperor. So that helps us, by the way, Luke documenting that helps us narrow down and again add validity to the birth of Jesus because it gives a very definitive time that everyone would be able to research and it would be universally accepted during those times. That Caesar Augustus made this decree that all the world should be registered. And this was the first registration, here comes another name, when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Quirinius actually served two terms as governor of Syria. Uh, his first term that he served was from 6 B.C. to 4 B.C., so a period of a little over two years in there. He must not have done too good because he got fired and got replaced. Well, apparently his replacement didn't do very well because then <clears throat> uh, about 10 years later in A.D. 6 uh, and through A.D. 9, uh, he served again. Now, as we try to kind of narrow down the birth of Jesus, by the way, the birth of Jesus probably didn't take place in 0 B.C. or 0 A.D. In fact, it probably was somewhere toward the end of this first term, somewhere around 4 B.C. Our calendars are not God's calendars. Remember that, you know. So somewhere around that time. It was during this time when Quirinius was first governor that, that again, this is a historical fact that Luke included, that people would know about, that added validity to who Jesus was. But why then? Why did it have to happen then? Well, let's think about Mary and Joseph. She's pregnant. How else would you get a betrothed, newly wedded, soon to be wedded, betrothed couple from Nazareth to Bethlehem? By the way, that was a walk, a walk, of about 90 miles. So a little over four days of walking time. They didn't have Delta. Delta wasn't ready when they were in this case. They didn't have the train. They didn't have a trusty Ford, Chevy, or Toyota to get into. They had a trusty donkey. Maybe they could put stuff on so they didn't have to carry that. That was their trunk, their luggage compartment, and they hoofed it themselves. Ninety miles. Uphill, downhill, around the curve, spending the night on the ground on their way. Why else would they have done that had they not been under government order to get back to Bethlehem? Because of what Augustus and Quirinius we're making them do. Why then? It was just the right time. God put the right rulers in place who had what may have seemed like the wrong ideas, but those right rulers with the wrong ideas were used by God and were part of the continuous plan of God to get Mary and Joseph from point A to point B. Now let me just stop and remind us why that matters to us. God has also prepared this time for you and you for this time. 
Now think about the times in which we live. Now we're not under, we're, we, we've gotten used to being under government taxation, okay? Uh, we don't have to go to our hometown. They're glad to come to us. We can mail the check in from where we are or direct deposit it from our account to the government. But we live in a very special time, especially over these last two years, because while it hasn't necessarily been something brought on by the government, think about all the changes in life COVID has brought about to us. And it's easy for us to think that these last two years have been out of God's control. Folks, nothing is ever out of God's control. Nothing is never happening. God is always up to something. So even these times in which we live, and you think about all the, the, the ways that COVID has altered our plans and the, and the way it's altered the way we think about life and do life, the, the expenses of things, the availability of things, uh, uh, the, the trust or mistrust of government, of, of, uh, of media, uh, of science, or whatever. I mean, think about how our lives have changed emotionally, spiritually, Physically, our lives have changed politically. Our lives have changed so many ways over these last two years. But understand that God is right in the middle of these times that we live in. Think about some of the maybe conversations that you have <clears throat> with your family and with your friends and with your coworkers about COVID and all that goes on with that. I can only imagine Mary and Joseph's conversation as they caravaned from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Why is Augustus making us do this? Why couldn't they have made an exception for us? This is all just, I'm sure they said at least once, this is just a government conspiracy. They're just trying to control our lives. Sound familiar? <laughs> you ever had those discussions with anybody? I'm, I'm sure they felt the same way. But even in that circumstance, God was at work. God had to get them from Nazareth to Bethlehem. We're going to look at why that in just a moment. But there was quite possibly no way Joseph would have stopped what he was doing, preparing the house so he could get on with his life with Mary. There was no way a pregnant woman who was pretty close to delivering would have made that trip had it not been for that decree. Let me ask you this. What is it about the times in which we live that God has prepared for us? It could be that God has made this moment for us to rise up like we've never risen up before and show the love of Jesus and to serve others who need serving. We are living in a time much like this first Christmas when there is a time that is devoid of hope a time that is dark, a time that needs light, a time that needs to hear a message of grace and redemption. When you think about all the fighting, all the turmoil, all the stress and strife that is in our world, how desperately we need a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, an everlasting Father, a Prince of Peace, how desperately this world needs to hear about Jesus. And all God has done is stirred the pot for us, and He's made it, it's almost like catching catfish in a barrel. If we would just be willing to go fishing. God has prepared a time for us, and He has prepared us for this time if we'll use this time for Him. COVID is an unusual time. It has altered our lives. But how is it possibly that God wants to use all of this in your life? For his purposes. You see, it's a continuing story. You've received the grace, and now you are participants in sharing the grace. And just like Augustus and Quirinius turned Mary and Joseph's life upside down, COVID has created the perfect environment for God to work and to work through us. If we'll get on his side and get on this program. But one final question, because, you see, this kind of begs that question. So, why couldn't Jesus have just been born of Nazareth? I mean, after all, that's where they wound up going back. He was known as Jesus of Nazareth. Why in the world 
Did he have to go 90 miles an hour to be born? I mean, it wasn't like there was this awesome maternity hospital in Bethlehem they were going to. Why in the world did it have to be there? Why did it have to be Bethlehem? Let's look at verse 6. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. She gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling cloths, laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. Let's think about, first of all, the city. Why Bethlehem? Well, we won't take the time to go back there, but if you look in Micah chapter 5, you see a prophecy that it would be from Bethlehem the Savior would come. There's some significance into the Savior who would be the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world coming from Bethlehem. There are two things about Bethlehem you need to know. First of all, you need to know that Bethlehem was an agricultural town. It was a small town, only about five and a half miles out of Jerusalem, but it was an agricultural town. And guess what kind of agricultural town it was? It was a sheep herding town. All around the, 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 the environs of Bethlehem, you would find flocks of sheep. It was no wonder there were shepherds keeping watch over their flock by night. They were all over the place in Bethlehem. So it was known as a place where sheep were raised. The second thing you need to know about that more specifically, it was also the place from which the sacrificial lambs used in Jerusalem came. Now there's a tremendous picture that the sacrificial lambs who came there laid out on the altar as a picture of God's redemption would come from Bethlehem and that there, born in that city, was the lamb who once and for all would be sacrificed to take away your sin and my sin. Why there? That was the place of redemption. That was the place that God had. Well, not just the city, but what about this thing they called the inn? Well, really, it wasn't a hotel. They didn't have five-star hotels. There was no Holiday Inn or Holiday Inn Express that was there. But the other times that we see this word, a couple of other times used in Scripture, it refers to a guest room in a house. <clears throat> you see, the Eastern culture is much more culture of hospitality than the Western culture is. I mean, it would be unheard of not to make room for somebody in your house if they needed somewhere to stay, especially if it was family, especially if it was family from 90 miles away who had traveled over four days to get there whose wife was about to burst forth in child. There was no place, there, there wasn't room in the guest room so we are left to believe then that they made room for them in the main part of the house where everybody else was. You say, well, what about this manger thing? It was not uncommon in uh, first century homes for the main house to be built with two rooms, the family room. In that family room, everything happened. That's where people, they all just laid out on mats and slept. They lived, they cooked, they ate. Everything kind of happened in that big one big room. Just outside that one big room was another covered area where they kept the animals. And there was really not a wall. There was kind of a rail that would keep the animals just from, you know, joining you in the family room. Nothing like, you know, rolling over and the family goat being right there looking you in the face. So there was at least a rail to keep them separated. But along that rail, in what was a sunken area where the animals kept, there were places dug out along that rail. Guess what those were? Those were feeding troughs. Those were mangers. So you see this picture. Instead of having a nice, quiet, secluded place for her to have her child, she had to have it in there where everybody was. Now, ladies, if you've had a child, you can imagine. That's the one time you want everybody in the world out of sight. In fact, you really, if you had your druthers, you'd like for your husband to be out of sight. I mean, he's the one that caused all this pain and agony and mess. But there in front of everybody, she gave birth. There's no baby bed, no bassinet. But there was this little feeding trough where a soft, dry place to lay the child. Humble. That's why there. Bethlehem would have been the perfect town for the perfect arrangement for that. 
But the swaddling cloths, I'm going to close with this because this, this is the kicker in the whole story. When Becca was born, I remember learning to swaddle. Swaddling came pretty easy for me once they showed it to me. Because swaddling a baby is made basically making a baby burrito. And if there was one thing I knew how to do, it was roll a burrito. All right? I mean, this was just a real tight burrito was all it was. So when you think of swaddling cloths, you kind of think, you know, every, every hospital when a baby is born, they send you home with the same blanket. They've had them for 100 years. You know, it's a square blanket with the pink and blue stripes that go down it. I see baby pictures people put on Facebook today, and they still have those same blankets. I think we still have one at our house that's 19 years, almost 20 years, over 19 years old now. You know, we kind of think it's wrapping them up in a... No, swaddling cloths were something very specific. In fact, they were also used to tie into the where they were, the why there. Swaddling cloths were easy to find in Bethlehem. Because when a lamb was born who was marked out to eventually be a sacrificial lamb in Jerusalem. Remember, the sacrificial lamb had to be perfect and without spot. When that sacrificial lamb, the moment it was born, it was wrapped in these cloths so that it would be kept warm and safe for its mission. Even at the birth of Jesus, Luke very vividly describes for those who would have pictured the scene clearly, clearly a redeemer who would one day give his life save the sins of mankind you see it's a continuous story we are both recipients and participants in this plan why there because it would be there that the story most vividly could be told that this was not just a child this was a human sacrificial lamb being born in the place where all the sacrificial lambs were born. In such a way that this was not a king who was born in a palace to famous parents with pomp and circumstance. This was not a person that would be, would be so celebrated but would be right there with the animals in such a way that it pointed to the sacrifice he would make for me and for you. You see, Bethlehem otherwise was a pretty insignificant place. You didn't want to go to Bethlehem because it was a sheep town. If you've ever driven down the interstate behind a livestock hauler, you thank God for passing lanes. You don't want to do that very long. For those of us from agricultural areas, it's the smell of money. But for others, it's the smell of something else. That's what Bethlehem smelled like. Because there's sheep everywhere. It was insignificant. Nobody paid any attention to Bethlehem until they wanted something. You know what? Sometimes our life feels that way. We may feel like the town of Bethlehem. We're small. We're insignificant. Surely God can't use us. But he chose the little nondescript town of Bethlehem. You may feel like, well, you know what? I'm just a face in a crowd. I'm just a number. I, I'm, I'm really just a nobody. Mary and Joseph couldn't find anywhere special to stay. They were just a face in a crowd in Bethlehem. But God used that. And no matter how insignificant you feel, God has you where he wants you to use you in the way He wants to use you. God has a plan. The Christmas story is a reminder to us that we are both recipients of the grace of that plan, but we are also participants in serving the community around us in the name of Jesus, whom we celebrate during this season. You may have embarrassing circumstances, you may feel a little bit like Mary or Joseph. Something in your past that you just you know people whisper about. And the devil every now and then tries to shame you. You need to give that shame to Jesus. He already took care of it. And know that God wants to use you because of that. 
Not in spite of that, but because of that. Know that this time in which we live is a very, very strange time. But it's a God-ordained time. It's a time for us to think creatively. It's a time for us to think with a kingdom mind. How can God use, this, use me in these unique circumstances and environments? How can God use me for His purposes of grace? You may feel insignificant or lost in the crowd, but God has you right where He wants you. Whether it's a job, a family, a neighborhood, a circumstance, you are part of that plan. Just as your story is being written, it is being interwoven into the grand story. And God is using you. That is the good news of great joy for all the people. For me and for you. Today, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, know that he came to die for you and to give his life for you so that you could have life. This whole plan was hatched with redemption in mind because none of us are able to save ourselves because we were all broken. Mary and Joseph were broken. Bethlehem was broken. Augustus was broken. Quirinius was broken. The whole world was broken. I'm broken. You're broken. And we can't fix it ourselves. He's calling on you to believe that he is the Son of God and he died on the cross for your sins. And in faith to turn to Him and embrace Him as the Savior and Lord of your life. You can do that by just praying in your own way today where you are. Asking Him to take your life and surrendering your life back to Him. And letting Him make you what He wants to be. If you are already a believer, a child of God, we need to be reminded today that our story is still being written this world in which we live and the things that are going on around us, as uncomfortable as they are and as frustrating as they may be, they are not by accident. Times in which we live and where you are and who you are, none of that has caught God off guard. So when we ask, why them? We could also answer, why not me? When we ask, why then? We could also ask, why not now? And when we ask why there, we can ask why not here, where I am. Will you surrender yourself to the work of God in you and through you and ask God to make you a participant as he writes his story in the lives of those around you?